says record. Hello, my name is Brock Davigno. This is the 21st century, the year 2023, and I'm going to talk about some events that affected my life in 1976 that had to do with Mike Medavoy and my mentor, Tad Danielewski. We had all been students of Tad at one time or another, and uh, I was uh, in college in 1976, and uh, that year was very interesting because on the 200th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, the lights went out in Utah, Wyoming, and Idaho for three days. I had uh, read a book by Ayn Rand called uh, Atlas Shrugged at age 16, and at age 22, I decided for the uh, declaration uh, anniversary, I would uh, read it again. Well, the refrigerators went out, and the people magically in the cafeteria thought that green beans in refrigerators after three days would still be good, and uh, wishful thinking, and 200, and actually 311 of us got uh, tomain poisoning. And I read this book again, to Take My Mind Off of the Pain, and I promised myself, uh, having read it, uh, that if the lights had ever gone out in Utah, which I thought might be the last place they'd do, uh, I'd uh, become a libertarian activist again. And they went out. And I survived and uh, organized a chapter of the Society for Individual Liberty. Now, at that time, it was just an American phenomenon uh, from 1969 forward uh, people who wanted free enterprise from the right and personal liberty from the left formed one cohesive philosophy and part of the gateway for many young people in not being compromising on such ideas was reading this book and uh, many others I found on the campus had uh, Brigham Young University and uh, within six weeks, we had 125 members of the Society for Individual Liberty. And uh, I was a uh, communications, uh, television and film student, uh, interested in advertising and PR, cause marketing. I like freedom. And um, that's what I wanted to sell in life. And solutions in freedom to humanitarian problems. So many libertarians went past this philosophy of Ayn Rand, which was more or less a lone individualism to let's please our customers and, and solve problems so all people can enjoy some prosperity and freedom. And nevertheless, it's a, a very significant book. And uh, one day, uh, Mike Medavoy, he had asked me, you know, who would you like to learn comedy? Uh, not Mike Medavoy, excuse me, Ted Danielewski had asked me who I wanted to learn comedy from, and I said, well, how about Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau? And the next Wednesday, Ted Danielewski had them there, and he had a, Jack Lemmon said the line, uh, comedy is serious business, and he didn't get the laugh he expected because we'd all heard that line from Ted Danielewski. He trained as well. And um, I had, uh, was a computer programmer since about age 16, and I had had this idea of computerizing up Ted's 77 elements of dramatic form which I later did, and uh, that became the basis of many screenwriter programs called uh, uh, Dramatica, uh, I think it's in its 10th version now, and Collaborator, and uh, this was across four genres, uh, and it originally started on a 70-foot piece of butcher paper, and uh, was laid across the floor at all of Ted's uh, professional actors workshop and professional directors workshop, professional screenwriters workshop, all participated in refining it. And uh, over the years, from 1976 to 1984, I got to know Tad Danielewski very well. And it wasn't unusual that some of his students were doing quite well and had made good decisions in life, and one of those was Mike Medivore. He was the youngest uh, Vice President of Production of United Artists at the time, and Tad invited him up uh, to tell us what he was doing and what meant something to him from what he'd learned in his workshops. So, all of us tended to trust each other's judgment because we'd been through this 77 elements of check checklisting uh, scripts and so forth to go between good to a great movie. And um, this was no different, but it was extraordinary in a couple of ways. 
Mike Medavoy was introduced to many of us, and uh, he had a film canister under his left arm, which we learned from him was uh, the rough cut of Rocky. And uh, he'd been showing this to audiences uh, again to see how he might improve it. So essentially he was on the hot seat and, and we were the, uh, the improvers with uh, quality Y at BYU or NYU, uh, had a quality N, and when he was at USC it was quality SC, that we would collaborate and help each other. And this was what we were intending to do. And um, Mike Medavoy was introduced to us and his uh, current achievements. And he was in his 30s, and we had, had understood that he'd come from Russia to China to Chile, and the American movies were what America was to him when he finally got here. Uh, rose from the mailroom up into the executive uh, choosing the scripts and actors for films. So how you do that was of great interest to us. And um, so as he's talking, he asks the question, uh, how many of you know what uh, new romanticism is? And my, my eyes perked up and my antenna went up and I said, the only people that use that phrase is somebody who's probably read Ayn Rand's book, The Romantic Manifesto. And to my knowledge, the only people that had read that were some young people uh, like uh, George Lucas and uh, John Wayne had read it, uh, I knew, um, perhaps Steven Spielberg and myself. So I, was, I raised my hand and uh, so somebody else he picked to answer it was, well, the hero um, manages to fight the bad guys and uh, gets wounded, uh, comes back, licks his wound, and uh, wins the victory over tremendous odds uh, through rising action and, and uh, rides off into the sunset with their horse or the girl, whichever. You know. And he seemed to like that answer. And uh, so I was paying rapt attention to, to him at this point. And um, so he proceeded to explain why empiricism and realism people walked out of the theater and they didn't think they got their money's worth because they weren't uplifted or inspired in any way uh, positively from either reality or uh, hope or science fiction. So um, he said three kinds of movies never make money in Hollywood. One is three cornered hat movies and I was very disappointed at this because uh, I was interested in doing some of those on American privateers who use the percentages you earn in finance as did country doctors and immigration to America. So I, like, I was a little perplexed. And uh, then he said, uh, uh, racing movies often don't do it either. And um, I was into a, the ideas of a charity champions racing league later, but I was intrigued with that, but it wasn't as important at the moment. And um, then finally he said, the movies about fighters, prize fighters, never make the box office. They might be good movies, but they just don't perform commercially. And he says, I happen to have one of those right here under my arm. I'm challenging all three of those victims. And I went, ooh. So I was paying even more attention to everything he said. And uh, he proceeded to explain uh, his philosophy of people in extraordinary circumstances, uh, historical or biographical or uh, various things that appealed to him in a script, which had echoes of what Ted Danielewski had taught us. And uh, I, I remember uh, hearing the story that uh, uh, Stallone had uh, wanted to play Rocky, and he's kind of a medium height, and that Mike Medavoy had said, you know, you're, you're not a heavyweight. You know, you wrote the script, but, you know, Stallone established the fact that he was buff, and uh, you can always uh, have uh, somebody slightly shorter as another would-be heavyweight to play it. So he got some percentage, presumably 4% for the script, which he a little cheated on, I understood, because he just went 15 rounds, Rocky goes the distance, and he's still on his feet at the, at the end. Um, and that was his victory, that was his goal. And he achieved that, uh, be it a limited goal or whatever, he managed to do so. And uh, we hadn't seen the movie as yet. And uh, I was intrigued with this philosophy that he could deal with hard-won battles that maybe you don't come out quite the victor. And yet you do, at least to yourself. And that had kind of a Randian uh, tilt to it. 
So at this point, you know, after about an hour, the uh, talk was over and the question answer session had gone by. But uh, I went down the aisle straight to Mike Medivoy, and he's a bit taller than I am, most people are. And uh, so I uh, was surrounded by this gaggle of people, Mr. Medivoy, Mr. Medivoy. And so I just tapped him on the shoulder and he turned around and I looked up at him and I said, when are you going to produce Atlas Shrub? And he looked right back at me and he said, America hasn't suffered enough yet to do so. And I said, how would you do it if you did? And he says, I would do it in a mini-series to do justice to a philosophical novel. And um, it would take some explaining in the rising action to set it up. And I said, I see. All right. And uh, so I said, thank you. And I wandered away. And uh, I went home. And I had been studying, uh, there were 792 investor-owned, privately-armed warships in uh, the American Revolution, and they captured 3,100 British Empire vessels. And uh, by war's end, the U.S. Navy and the state navies had 64 ships out there, and only three were left operable. So this was how everything George E. Washington fought with came along from these ships, captured English brown vest muskets and so forth. And there were some extraordinary stories I had read uh, from an 1898 book called uh, uh, in Stanton McClay's American Privateers. And uh, Captain Coggeshall, who had been in the war for free trade and sailors' rights for 323 privateers, had done the same thing capturing 3,100 British Empire vessels of the greatest military and naval power on earth with subscription uh, purchases of $5 gold coins from ladies in the revolution who didn't want tea monopolies or uh, judicial monopolies or anything with a stamp act and so forth. And so they said, buy some gunpowder and ropes, fellows, and go do it. And I had in my mind who these people were and what some of the best stories biographically were. And um, so I copied raw history because Mike Medavoy was a history graduate. And I knew I could communicate with him on this level because I'm a bit of a historian myself. And um, put it in a yellow binder that was yay big and put on it the uh, History of American Privateers in a yellow binder. And I sent it off to him where I knew he would read it as his Chippendale desk, which was a lot like uh, French provincial curves on the legs. And I, very much um, like that. And um, I imagined it was there and it would stick out past all the other scripts that were just eight and a half by 11. Sure enough, he did read it. And he wrote back to me at college and he says, I have three suggestions having read this. And there were some extraordinary stories of a Jonathan Harridan who had uh, fired crowbars when he ran out of cannonballs and uh, had another time had uh, um, blasted away to his last cannonball and pulled out a pocket watch, pulled right up to the other British ship and started reading off minutes, giving him five minutes to surrender. And both sides were bloodied and the British surrendered. And uh, they went on like this, various exploits. And uh, so his first reaction was, this is, you know, truth is stranger than fiction, and that uh, you could make a composite privateer out of many of these uh, things, sort of like Raphael Sabatini had done uh, with some of his romance novels, only this was much better. And um, that he was very interested in um, one event was his second alternative. It could be the, uh, the history of the battle of Fort McHenry and the Maryland militia. Uh, and the remnants of the 5th United States Army that had been defeated in Washington, D.C., and facing off with the full might of the British fleet and uh, Marines and Army, and which they managed to pull off with excellent preparations and using newspapers to advertise the right size cannonballs to the right size cannon. And um, so I figured, well, okay, that would be the, the best event. And I later wound up collaborating with a fellow named Tip Boxell, who had been an uh, uh, enlisted man and an officer in every war we've fought from that time since. 
And he had uh, been inspired by my advice talking about Mike Medavoy to write a book, The Star Spangled Banner. And um, uh, he was a friend of a uh, college roommate named Lance C. Williams, who was also one of Ted Danielewski's students and who became uh, uh, Ted's protege and has continued the professional actor's workshop as I think it's the second longest running workshop with its standards in Hollywood. And um, uh, Lance uh, will take some students and he'll use percentage as you earn. You don't have to pay me off of slinging hamburgers, but whatever you make off of acting or modeling or directing, that's what you do. And um, so a lot of that historical knowledge that year I sat down to write, and it uh, was pretty much finished by 1978, and it's on a website today called payehome.org. And that'll leave you some other things about it, how to solve some problems in freedom. And um, the third uh, alternative uh, was to kind of like what he was talking about with uh, the Atlas Shrugged was the evolution of ideas. Uh, whether I knew what he was talking about because in various ways it had described how you motivate a crew, whether that's a production crew in, in films or uh, on a sailing ship, that one third of the money from entering a prize of the enemy, and it was judged by a court to be a British ship, but not Portuguese, or you had to give it back, uh, would go to the little ladies who uh, capitalized it, although there were two female privateer captains, one in the American Revolution and one in the War for Free Trade. And um, so I thought, well, there's another aspect of an episodic uh, version of this. And um, to bring to life these characters in the history would be possible if enough research was done because, again, truth is stranger than fiction. So Mike set me off on that and changed Tim Boxell's life and he published a book and he's dying of cancer and has asked me to uh, augment it with the research that I have also done in the last uh, decade. Um, then um, one of the other things that happened was because I had let it be known among the American Society of Individual Liberty chapters that Mike Medavoy, a fellow who picked scripts and actors for them, was interested in Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. So this went to an organization in Europe called Libertarian International. And two years later, I was asked by the leaders of the American SIL and Libertarian International to combine organizations into a global um, effort for a consistent philosophy of freedom and to reach out to other young people. And so as one of the co-founders of that, I can tell you today there are libertarians in 90 nations and undergrounds throughout the world that uh, were motivated by this hope that some of their ideals might be seen on a big screen. In later years, uh, I had uh, found some people who had bought the rights to Atlas Shrugged and uh, Lionsgate somehow got a hold of it and they had a guy that I had written to Mike about it and he didn't much like this fellow's ethics. And so I backed away, that was good enough for me. So uh, they proceeded with another fellow to do a, sort of an episodic three versions of the movie. Didn't have quite the budget I thought that it ought to have and some production values could have been better but for a low budget set of films it wasn't too bad. Uh, but it could have been much better on about 50 different categories that we both know. And um, I understand uh, over the years that uh, all of us appreciated Tad more and more. And so I have interacted with several other people, but I thought that Tad might have discussed some of the things that he discussed with me. Uh, one evening while I was... Uh, skull cracking on how to you know make this uh, computer software I knew uh, Ted was a night owl and I had spotted a book in the Lee library it was a very big oversized book and it was on silk paper which was unusual and it was all in German and it had death's heads on it and it was some sort of a Gestapo map of all of the rail routes in Poland to all of the death camps 
And I looked at it and I went, oh, I know just who needs to see this. So I closed it up and I went over there and sure enough, about eight o'clock at night, there was Tad working late. And um, I said, you got a minute or two or three? And he goes, sure. And I set the book down and it was interestingly in both Polish and German from what I could discern. And I opened, I just set it on, on his table. And he backed up in his chair and he looked at this thing and he looked at me and he looked at that. He didn't say a word. And he opened the thing up and he goes, there, there, there. He goes to another rail complex for another death camp. There, there. He goes past a couple and he goes, there. <laughs> he knew where all these places were. I certainly didn't know Polish or anything else. But he went through the whole book like this. It must have been at least 30 of these uh, silk uh, pages. I don't know if they were designed for somebody to eat if they were captured at the time. But anyway, um, when he was done, I, I looked at him and I said, um, we've known each other for a while. Could you explain what's going through your mind and heart? And he says, well, I've told you that at the end of the war, after being a prisoner, which like he, he said Buchenwald, I, it took me a moment to realize that's what he was saying, and I was sort of horrified. And then he said, uh, I made my way to England, and I saw this Broadway play uh, that came out of the Midwest of America called Oklahoma. And it was a story of good and evil clashing and how you have to deal with it and make your mind up to deal with it, and uh, then take it on. And he says, whatever country that made that, that's where I wanted to be. And I kind of thought for a moment, like, well, here's Mike Medavoy making his way across the world, and sort of a similar analogy, and other people he'd introduced me to. And he, I said, well, okay, but this is during the war. Uh, in other words, what did you do, Daddy, in the war? <laughs> and he laughed for a moment. It was kind of this almost hysterical laugh. And um, he said, I was 17, and uh, the Nazis had invaded Poland, and I began rapidly to understand what was going on, and I pulled together a brigade of, of some Jewish people, and we would attack the train the locomotives, and we would blow them up, and uh, we would assault the things, take out the guards, and we would open up the cattle doors. And I would try to explain to the people, I knew some German, he said, in, in Polish, and I tried to explain to them that they were going to be cooked at the other end of the line. And uh, the people would respond, well, I, I have a, a, an iron cross here, my country wouldn't do that. Or if they were Polish, you know, he's trying to explain, this is, this is your choice to live or die. Uh, and they were hemming and hawing whether they were going to get out of the cattle car. And he says, I haven't got time to argue with you. I wish I could tell you something to explain reality to you. But the Nazis are going to be coming down this road momentarily. And either you come with us or you don't. And sometimes only one man and one woman would get off the whole train. And they would wait. And the Nazi guards would come and close the doors off and haul the train where it was supposed to go. I guess by pushing it. But anyway, he did this not once, but here, here, here many times. And I was just astonished at this. And he uh, didn't say much about his, I guess, year in Buchenwald. He was rescued by Patton's Third Army, who with film documented uh, everything so the world would actually believe the horror and uh, made some of the people in the area go through these death camps and other places. But uh, anyway, uh, I went to the Holocaust Museum in the year May, 2000 May, and I went to the roof of this building where there was a, uh, on the roof, the top floor of the museum, and there was a very busy librarian who wasn't too helpful. And I was explaining, I was looking for information about Ted Danielski. He wasn't Jewish, but he led the second largest Jewish brigade in the Polish resistance, and I would like to write a movie about it. And um, so, she was busy, busy, he wasn't helping, and this older fellow in a black hat and long Hasidic uh, locks, uh, black coat, came up and he says, in a kind of an accented voice, which I assume was Polish, he says, uh, 
did you say Todd Danielewski? And, uh, and I go, yes. And he says, um, I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for this man. You know? And it sounded very much like Tad's, you know, let us review in his kind of Polish accent he'd slip into when he did that. And I, I smiled and, and he says, um, let me help you. And so he got the attention of the librarian. He says in a very authoritative voice, like he owned the place, give this man anything he wants and help him now. <laughs> well, thank you. you know. And uh, so she proceeded to do so on an early you know, kind of uh, computer and was looking for things. And then I turned around to see the fellow to see if he was satisfied you know, what was happening. And he was, he'd disappeared. He'd gone. And I said, well, you keep working what you're doing. I'll be back. And I went around the building. I looked in the bathrooms and everything for this fellow, but I couldn't find him. And so I came back and said, do you know who he was? And the librarian says, a survivor, I suppose. I went, Oof. <laughs> but, but she was doing what he said. You know? But she drew a blank. And the museum and the, the library was fairly new, so I figured between May of 2000 and now uh, April of 2023, maybe they've got a few more references and it'd be worth checking on that source to see. But um, Tad had... Uh, was honored by the Jewish community in New York in particular, and he later wound up an acting coach with NBC. And um, he'd do things like give our class uh, uh, an opportunity to redo what NBC executives thought was a good idea, but he didn't, and turn to us to see how we would improve it. And uh, it, it, it sounded very much sometimes like I was hearing echoes of big business, like Mike Medavoy, the real politic of, of Hollywood. But let's see how we can one-up them. And uh, so I rejected the script, and I turned it 180 degrees around of a sex-crazed sheriff in Texas who would, like a spider, trap people coming through her little Texas town. And I said, nah, and I said that you can't build episodes out of that. How many people are you going to collect in this Texas town or graves? So I said, make the sheriff a woman who has got a reputation for being a ditz, but is really smart. Maybe somebody like Lucille Ball who invented the street camera shoot or something. And uh, the men deputies around her are sort of dunces. And there's a comedic effect there. And then she helps people with their problems as they come through this Texas town, and there would be many adventures this way. So NBC accepted that, and they liked it. And I'll say in some other videos that uh, Mike could look at that if he's interacted with uh, Arch Madsen of Bonneville International, Radio Free Europe, uh, where I helped him create Radio Free Asia by using last year's Maytag and uh, Ford commercials to fund an effort that would not be by the CIA or not be by the State Department that people in Asia might actually believe and create some psychic dissonance between the free market and uh, which he thought was a great idea. Or Robert Wise, uh, Ted put me with to improve his Star Trek the movie on um, the anticipated computer graphics a year, uh, or 10 years from then. And so I projected that and he did it in 14 years later, the director's edition, Star Trek movie, if you want to check it out. And uh, anyway, there are other incidences that Mike may have crossed paths. And um, one of those was on the Olympics that Tad uh, was very distressed about this boycott by President Carter of the Soviets for invading Afghanistan. At the, the, in his opinion, the Olympics were a peace armistice so enemies could compete and see that each other's human. And then on, back on the battlefield when the Olympics are over, they wouldn't kill each other, they'd just take each other prisoners. And I thought that was a pretty good case. He says, does anybody here know anybody in the Reagan administration? And I said, I raised my hand, I knew a, a speechwriter for Reagan. A uh, fellow named Dana Rohrbacher was one of those 1969 libertarian splits from the Young Americans for Freedom from the Conservatives. And um, He's one of these guys that would burn a draft card and burn a social security card at the same time, which I thought was somewhat admirable. And uh, he uh, then was receiving what I did on a one-page set of thoughts of Taz and sent it off. And in 48 hours, there's President Reagan on television using exactly the words that Tad had used uh, to explain that 
the Olympics is a peace armistice. And as far as he was concerned, uh, we can always run foot races against any of our enemies and maybe we'll beat them, you know, kind of thing. In the 1984 Olympics, I understood that Mike Medavoy had a lot to do with it. It was the, the first completely commercially non-tax supported Olympics there ever was. And uh, it was high contrast to 1936 ones in Berlin, I suppose. So this was something that I thought our lives might have intersected on. And with the uh, phone voter television network in 1992, where the audience gets to talk back to presidential candidates, uh, one of the four candidates that we created was Ross Perot with asking two phone votes, do you believe uh, what you should do with abortion in your family, yes or no, whether you like it or not? And 77% of America said no. And then uh, would you favor a penalty of a doctor or to a woman for having one, yes or no? And 73% of America said, no, nah, I don't like it, but I'm not going to force anybody. But this 3% difference, I called up a fellow, and uh, he said, Davino, I, I don't like any of your um, punitive uh, choices. And I said, I said, if you want somebody to behave the way you want, you offer them an incentive or a bribe. And I go, well, what, what do you have in mind? And he said, um, well, how about offering a scared young woman a two-week pleasant Hawaiian vacation? And uh, enter some folic acid for the baby, and if she brings it to term, she gets the vacation, whether she keeps it or she uh, gives it away in an adoption. And I'm like, ooh, that's interesting. I get a couple sponsors out of that spot, so we kicked that out to America on satellite TV with uh, phone numbers under the screen and so forth, and telepoles. And a um, third of America liked it that same week at least Peronista's supporters, which were getting to be bastard, and the women supported him with this kind of wisdom, which mirrored America's basic feelings. And uh, he climbed up to 31% and then 50% and so forth. We had Brown Buchanan and an obscure Arkansas governor who was out of money, he had about $50,000 left, and had asked me uh, how he would communicate with that budget with America because he couldn't afford the $150,000 I wanted per month for satellite feed and everything else. And I said, well, you know, there's a, a one last satellite uplink truck in America that you could snag for, and I wanted to do interactive. Well, he went around me and uh, he got the satellite truck and cut out the interactivity because all of his mistresses would, you know, be calling in and uh, that would sort of make his wife's lighting through her teeth about her man uh, invalid and uh, didn't work. So Clinton wound up on a campaign trail uh, with not one bus, but you know, 10 of them cruising around and uh, the money and the donations came in from the audience. So we're, we're doing that with debatetourney.com this year in 2023, 2024 with all federal and gubernatorial candidates. And uh, I understood that Mike Medavoy was one of the uh, people who did fundraising uh, for Clinton at that era. So our paths again sort of crossed in the night. And uh, lessons where people matter, uh, the opinions of people matter were there. In the case of Clinton, he didn't want to listen to anybody. Uh, Buchanan and Brown both uh, were climbing and climbing against Bush, and uh, he was an 89% uh, a popular president a year before, but he got defeated because none of these candidates I invited, all of them that were running, didn't want to do that. But Ted taught us something, and it's like, why should the audience care? And I figured one of the best ways to have the audience care was to hear what they had to say. So these lessons from Ted came to me, and I was always very curious, and I, I hope Mike Medavoy uh, explains how Tad's other students and him, but mostly the history of Tad's ideas came into play in his life. And I would appreciate that uh, from Mike very much in honor of Tad Danielewski. Thank you.